I'm Tanisha Spain, host of Mid-American Gardener. And as you can see, we're out of the studio once again. We are at Urbana's Market at the Square, and I'm joined with my pal, Marty Alanya here, one of our panelists. We've got Ella Maxwell and Doug Williams here as well, so stay tuned for them. Um, but, but first, Marty, introduce yourself and tell the folks a little bit about you. Hi, I'm Marty Alanya. I am retiring as landscaper, and I'm passing it on to a family member who is just delightful. This is so great. I get to share my knowledge with my granddaughter whether she wants me to or not. And then maybe retire. It's maybe. Fabbing. Maybe. Yeah, I keep trying. Well, I have to help her, but yes. you know. Yes. So, yes. so yeah. So uh, perennials, uh, the shrubs, private yard. All you of know. it. Yeah. People's small gardens is my specialty. Nobody's called me to do Windsor Castle yet. So. Just keep the phone lines open. You never know. It hurts me. You never know. It hurts. Well, we've got some questions that have come in. We've got some pictures. We've got a couple of things that we're going to explain and talk about. But first, we've got Pat Alexander who wrote in and wants to know if it's okay to put tomatoes next to marigolds and marigolds next to tomatoes. Absolutely. It are they totally pals? is. They are. And the marigolds will certainly help to repel some pests that you don't want to visit your tomatoes. Um, I rarely grow annuals mm -hmm. unless they're you know vegetables <laughs> <laughs> and even then I do as many perennials as possible <laughs> but I, I got two little pots and I put annuals in them and the rabbits climbed up on my porch wow and chewed them down to nothing just like heard a lot of that. and petunia and the pots are this tall and they're up on the porch Oh, it hurt me. Very in, bold. In my own, oh, oh, Very bold, ah, yes. Like they own the place. <laughs> so I went and bought some more because I'm an idiot. And I got some marigolds and some vinca, which rabbits don't like. And I put those in the pot along with the other things. And so far, so good. So far, so good. I okay. also put some in with my herbs. I've got a galvanized barrel that I put them in. And they, they also chewed the living snot out of those two. Yes, it's not. You're welcome. You know, we were at a garden center, my mom and I, just yesterday, and we were talking about rabbits. Actually, like a small cluster of people forms talking about rabbits. Yeah. And this lady said that she uses coffee, not brewed coffee yep. grounds, yep. and just kind of dumps them at the mm -hmm. base of the things that she doesn't want the rabbits to bother, and they can't stand the smell. Yeah. And I've heard um, Irish Spring soap. Yes. Is that another one? Irish Spring is actually good for deer repellent as well. Okay. People okay. will drill a hole in them and hang them on bushes and things that they don't. Interesting. Yeah, and for smaller animals like rabbits or squirrels, you can kind of shave it with a with a potato peeler. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get the little peelings. Put the little pieces around there, or you can put the shavings in a bag and hang them here. You know, on something you don't want Whatever to chewed on. I want to chew on things, but I don't want to share it with rodents. <laughs> I've also heard of people putting plastic forks face up out of a pot, but yeah. I don't know. That's just not aesthetically pleasing. I don't think so. <laughs> so also, they don't. Rabbits also don't like to walk on sweet gum balls. So okay. if you happen to have a neighbor, or you actually own a treasure trove of sweet gum balls yourself, which nobody ever wants, yeah, <laughs> mulch with them. Okay. Yeah. We took the long way around, okay. but basically, marigolds and tomatoes are absolutely good pals. Good yes, pals. they are. Now we've got a plant ID question, and we're okay. gonna put this up on the screen so you guys can see it. Alrighty. This came in and she says her plant app identifies this as an aster, mm -hmm. but Google says something else. What do you think? It's an aster. It's an aster, okay. Yes. And then as far as care goes, the second part of the question is, do you deadhead this or cut it back for more blooms? Does that is that a true thing to do? Yeah, people think about asters as a as a fall blooming plant mm -hmm. and they'll start about now and if they're tall you can get away with shearing them and then they'll come back again if they're not that tall mm -hmm. i would gather them up and clip the first two or three inches off just like you do with um uh chrysanthemums mm -hmm. everybody wants mums in the fall but yes. you got to plant them in april so <laughs> so so they Always and a then, season ahead. And yeah, and they'll always start to put on buds and they'll start to bloom in July. And then you're like, no, no, too soon, too soon. So, mm. you know, yeah, just go mm -hmm. snip them off. You'll get, when you when you cut that main bud off of a stem, because each stem has a flower at the terminal end, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll get more flowers, but smaller. Okay. And later, because you really don't want them blooming until September. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can push them back like that. 
Okay. You know, you can just annoy them. And they're like, oh, I lost buds all right. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> Make some more. I love deadheading because of the surprise that you get a couple of days later when you've got all those beautiful, oh, yeah. beautiful, beautiful blooms. Yeah. Unlike the petunias and things like yeah. that. And salvia. Yes. And cat mint. Yes. You give them a shearing and they just. It's a good reward. Keep on ticking. Yes. Yeah, they do. Now you've been out in your yard taking some pictures. I have. What's blooming in your neck of the woods? Well, I got a plethora of daylilies. Daylilies. And I'm going to mention. Time. Yep. Yep. We're going to have. Colors? Uh, Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 No orange. Not not a huge fan of orange, but I have. Ooh. This is a small variety called Little Grapeette. It's a purple. She's gorgeous. It's a. It's not even a lavender purple. It's a. It's a true purple. Mm -hmm. It's a smaller flower, maybe three inches across, and it also has a diminutive height. So it's a daylily that won't romp and stomp and get all its leaves stepped on along the edge of a of a sidewalk or something, mm -hmm. and it's also um, re-blooming. So once it starts, it just blows. It just it's, goes and yep, goes. Yep, I've got a couple That's of really them. really pretty. Different places around the yard. They're, they're, you know, you think, oh, they're small. Well, some things are just too small, but some things are small and really cute. So these are one <laughs> of those things that are- Maintenance-wise. Small and really cute, <laughs> yeah. Is it is it tough to take care of daylilies? No, we God, love that. no. We love no, that. We love a low maintenance. With the roaches and the, Japanese you it's fine no it's fine um uh next up is big bird it's a as you might expect a, a massive yellow Very day pretty. lily yeah it's like this big across and it's like and it's really tall so you can just kind of see it you know just <laughs> like the character for whom it was named Bright yellow with a little bit of a white stripe. They're really, really mm -hmm. nice. If I'm not mistaken, they're also a rebloomer. Once these guys start, most of them kind of keep going for, I don't know, until it gets really hot in August and then they'll, they'll rebloom. So this is a favorite. That's I don't know if you can see that very gorgeous. Well. It's a creamy yellow with a, with a purple blotch and then a pie crust edge. It's all wavy. It's very fancy. And then the edges are also purple little picketty edge around the purple edges there just gorgeous very nice this is a tall um variety this next one hyperion it's also yellow but yellow gives such a little punch of color in the garden it's an old classic i bet hyperion is what 50 years old at least oldie but a goodie oh yeah very Love reliable that. i have it at the feet of a jack manny clematis and it's all blooming together right mm -hmm. now and it's fabulous <laughs> so this is the best time of year. Yeah, you know. It's, even we could do this all day, Marty. Even a blind sow will find an acorn once in a while. I'm like, that's a good combination there. This is uh, Gentle Shepherd. Okay. Joan Sr. is the classic white daylily. But this one, Gentle Shepherd and Sunday Gloves, give it a pretty good run for its money. They're just really, really white. And it's hard to get one that doesn't yellow out. And the very last one I have is called Cranberry Cove. It's just a medium-sized little daylily, but it's pink with a raspberry blotch and a green throat, and it's just, it blooms. That's and it blooms, and it blooms some more. So it's delightful. Put it in the front of the daylily bed or in the front of the garden. It's medium height, maybe two feet, so you can appreciate it because it keeps on ticking. Love it. So All I think right. that's the last one I got here. Thank so. you, Miss Marty. I sure. thank you so much for stopping by our a farmer's Absolutely. market day. Are you going to go buy anything and go check it out? Coffee. Yeah. Coffee would be good. DJ went Wouldn't and got a like coffee some... first thing. He dropped yeah. bags and beelined for a coffee. So we'll turn you loose so you he's, can go get one. He's my kind of guy. <laughs> All right. We're going to go you. catch up with Ella and Doug. Marty, thanks so much for coming out. No problem. <laughs> See ya. Look who we found at the market. Ella Maxwell joins us now with another segment. So uh, before we get into all the things that you brought, introduce yourself and tell folks a little bit about you. Hi, I'm Ella Maxwell. I'm a Tazewell County Master Gardener. I've worked at a garden center. Uh, I'm a horticulturist and I love uh, perennials and I brought some things to share today. Excellent, a show favorite. We've got a question that kind of goes along with one of the items that she brought. Sue Ingram writes in, how do I prune my thornless blackberries? And you got lucky today because Ella has some. I brought some blackberries and I do grow the thornless blackberry. Let me just pull that out. 
Um, I brought raspberries too because the black raspberry is pretty much like the uh, blackberry. They are fruiting now. Mm -hmm. Give me so to hold something. Can I help you? We've got we've got the fruit, and uh, this of course is a black raspberry. Mm -hmm. But once the blackberries are done fruiting and you've harvested the fruit, which will be in the next month by okay. the end of July, um, then those canes need to be cut out because they're going to die back. And in the meantime, the new canes, the primo canes for next year's mm -hmm. harvest are starting to form. And that's the same way it is with um, the raspberries. So what you want to do, as far as pruning goes, is remove the fruiting cane when you're done harvesting from this year. From this year. Mm -hmm. And then you want to tip back the new cane so they don't get so long and sprawling. And that will promote branching. Uh, this one, this fruit here just came off of a side branch. So you're going to, in the summer, you're going to tip back this new growth. Okay. And so just you don't, that much is enough? Yes. Okay. You don't need a pruner. You just need to stay on top of it. And then this will cause some side branching. Otherwise, what happens is they all go down in black mm -hmm. raspberries to start another plant, which you can do as well. But the thornless blackberries, of course, are the nicest because no thorns. Now I do have some other berries here that have thorns. I wanted to ask you briefly on this one. Yes. I have these and they are, I'm just trying to think of just, just that tip part is all that you want to yeah. take off. You don't want to cut anything largely back because they're kind of gangling. Should I train them on my trellis? Oh, right, yes. yes. Um, the easiest way to do that is to just uh, create kind of a square around it with, okay. with some, um, uh, like um, rope or something gotcha. like that. And then you can just keep them up in that space. This is a goji berry. So it's going to make kind of a little pepper-like fruit. It was a health craze plant. Mm -hmm. It needs a, a support. It needs some kind of trellis because it just wants to keep vining. Gotcha. It's, I don't really do anything with it. It's. Do you eat the fruits? Uh, have you have you yeah, had them? Yeah, oh, I eat the fruits, but I only like them covered in chocolate. <laughs> Another one is a gooseberry. Now, this one also has thorns, as does the goji berry. So you need to be careful. Careful with that. Um, they're green, and then they turn um, this red dark purpley color when they're ripe. Mm -hmm. So you can make a gooseberry pie. These are the wild gooseberries with these large thorns. There are several better varieties with much larger fruit. One is called Pickwell, okay. if you really like. Um, but I think all the small fruits are great. Raspberries, I agree. blueberries, a little harder to grow. And of course you have to protect everything from whatever wants to get them, birds, rabbits, deer, Insects, and the like. All yes. Of them. Everyone. Yes. Everyone's out to get your, your berries. That's it. Oh, that's it? Oh, no, no, I did bring one other thing. Okay, I probably bought this at a plant sale and thought that it was the wild strawberry of my youth. And- Scientific name? It's- not a strawberry at all. It does have a scientific name. You can look it up. It's called the mock strawberry, mock strawberry. or the Indian strawberry. It is an exotic um, invasive weed. And you can see these runners. And you know it's the mock strawberry because real strawberries have white flowers. This oh. has a yellow flower. Real strawberries have fruit that are facing downward. Okay. This one has fruit that is facing upwards. And the most important thing is this is tasteless. Just so if you see tasteless. these at a, if you see these at a plant sale and they're small starts, is right. there any way to know at that stage? There's not. There's not. Okay. And so people think they have these wild strawberries and this plant is, is creeping everywhere mm. in my garden. Yeah. So every spring, every summer, every fall, I'm pulling it out. So this, 
this can have potential to get invasive and kind of get into right, everything. Right. Yes, it can. Now it does make a good little ground cover patch, but mm -hmm. it can get into your lawn weeds and such. Mm -hmm. And because I don't really like to use chemicals, I'm just hand pulling it. How long has this been a problem in your, is this the first year you've had to pull oh, this? No, no I, I've tried to be on top of it, but it really hasn't worked. Are there any other weeds in your yard that are that you see every year coming up? I'm battling thistle this year. Oh, luckily I do not have thistle. I'm battling thistle. Okay. It's not fun. It right, is not fun. Right. So when you said hand pulling, because right. I've been doing a lot of that. I, I have been pretty vigilant with weeds, but they still get ahead of you. You can't stop. It really makes a difference in your garden. Uh, I think mulching helps. I try to leave most of my leaves mm. and I, plant kind of densely together, mm -hmm. um, but they they still sneak in and um, I'm, I'm pulling them out and, and then usually I compost everything. The compost usually gets hot enough to kill most of the weed seeds. Mm -hmm. And the compost that I use really goes back in my garden that's covered with straw. So I don't have that much of a weed carryover problem. But just staying on top of it is the, the oh, key. Yeah. Yeah. Doing a little pulling every day. Well, you know, if or you a lot. If, <laughs> if you have a large yard, it's never ending. That's and true. that's the problem that I have. That's Too true. big of a yard for as much weeding as I'm willing to do and my husband's willing to do. Gotcha. Well, Ella, thank you so much for stopping by and seeing this at the farmer's market today. Are you going to go do any shopping? Oh, oh we, you already we've did. already shopped. And she bought plants, ladies and gentlemen. That's so, right. Food right. and plants. <laughs> thank you, Ella. Thank you so much. <laughs>
uh, if you get to them before the birds do. I uh, want to ask you a question. Yeah. We, we met with Rusty Malding a couple weeks ago, and he was talking to us about paying attention to what trees are in the landscape for when you're going to plant underneath it. So was this a good decision here, the yew, the tree, and it's for sunlight needs? Was this well thought out? I think so. I mean, yeah. the tree has a nice uh, mature height right now. It's limbed up, and it's pretty tall. Most of them are usually a little bit shorter. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have enough sunlight. The yews are pretty tough plants. They aren't ones that are going to, you know, piddle out. Mm -hmm. And if so, you can probably find another species or another cultivar to bring in. Um, okay. Then we got some ornamental grass back there. It looks like miscanthus or maidenhair grass. Mm -hmm. We have uh, one of my favorites, threadleaf coreopsis. Um, it has a very fine texture. This um, is pretty. And the flowers are kind of here and there, like little stars of uh, gold and yellow. Mm -hmm. And that plays well because the complementary colors, if you think about, you know, when you're painting or yes. or even now as an adult, um, you have uh, those colors that are opposite on the color wheel, both yellow and purple, much like green and red. And mm -hmm. the other one is, of course, University of Illinois colors, orange <laughs> and blue, right? Now, this is a perennial? Yeah, these are perennials, yeah, so they'll come back. So that's what's nice about them. You plant them, they'll begin to spread. Uh, in some cases, if they're in your home garden, you can share them with neighbors because mm -hmm. you need to divide them up. But for the most part, it helps fill in, keeps out many of the weeds. I can see that they've had, uh, I see the spent tulip heads that are sticking out. Mm -hmm. And so those will come up earlier than this actually leaves out. And so you have a combination of uh, timing. And so with that, as the, uh, the tulips uh, absorb energy with their leaves still remaining, you have the coreopsis come up and the mm -hmm. other perennials that will play into mm -hmm. that. Uh, I also see some liatris uh, in the back uh, with the purple uh, spike mm -hmm. um, floor uh, expression. And then we also have, I think, butterfly bush. Yes. If we come down here a little bit further, right next to some of our purple coneflower, which you know about because you can have uh, their teas. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I think Ooh, it's look part. at the head on this one. Yeah, it's a little... That's kind of unique. It's unique. It? It's a... Uh, it looks like a number eight, huh? It does. And you so don't see that every day. That uh, the beauty of imperfection. Uh, I'm a member of the Ikenobo School, the oldest school of Japanese flower arrangement. So that would be something I would uh, love to uh, arrange from because it has some unique interest. Um, That's really Than neat. just what's typically found in uh, echinacea, and then this is a uh, milkweed. Yes, and I wonder if it's that time yet. You I see don't any? See any? And we have we're looking for. Um, the monarch butterflies, because it, it's the one plant that the monarch yes. butterfly will lay its, uh, its eggs on because that's what the larvae will eat from. Uh, and so if you want to attract monarch butterflies mm -hmm. and also give them the habitat that they need, uh, it's really important. What's your favorite plant when you're working in a landscape or you're putting in um, someone's yard or, or just kind of overseeing a project? What's your favorite thing to put in? Well, perennials are one of my favorites. I think uh, I like turf and grass, mm -hmm. it has its place. But um, perennials, you only have to really cut them either in the fall if you so choose or keep that winter interest and cut them in the spring instead of, so you get all these extra hours back. We love a low maintenance garden. And that's, and it's so <laughs> many, it's, it's hundreds if not thousands of different plants other than the, the range of turf grasses that you can plant, so. Wonderful. Well, Doug, thank you so much for stopping by and seeing us at the farmer's market. We'd love to see you more. If we, next time you get to Champaign-Urbana, you have to give us a call and get back on the show. I will do. Look all forward right. to seeing you all. Thank you guys so much, and thank you. And that is the show for this week. Big thanks to Ella Maxwell, Marty Alanya, and Doug Williams for coming out. And also a big thank you to Urbana's Market at the Square for letting us come and hang out today. I'm gonna go do a little shopping when we finish here because there are a few things I had my eye on back there. If you've got questions for our panelists, send them in to yourgarden at gmail.com. You can also find us on socials. Just look for Mid-American Gardener. That's it for this week. We will see you next time. Good night.